Hello and welcome to this first edition of the audiobook for the Loco Spotter's Guide, narrated by Timothy Castle. Introduction The first person to be recognised as a Loco Spotter was 14-year-old Fanny Johnson, who is known to have kept a record of locomotive numbers and names in 1861. However, it was not until the early 1940s that loco spotting took off in earnest, when Ian Allen, a young man employed as a public relations clerk by the Southern Railway, set up the Loco Spotters Club and published a series of books called the ABCs. At one point, the Loco Spotters Club had over 300,000 members. The ABCs were small, pocket-sized books that contained the numbers of all locomotives operated by British Railways. They were available in individual parts that covered a particular railway region, or as a combined volume. These were supplemented by another book containing locomotive shed allocations. ABCs allowed the loco spotter to tick off all the locomotives that he, or she, had seen, or copped as it was known. They generated camaraderie and rivalry among spotters of all ages in their battles to complete a class or to cop an unusual loco. The hobby reached its peak in the 1950s to 1960s. And, despite a diminishing railway, has survived to the present day, albeit to a much lesser degree. Loco spotting has many different aspects, which range from collecting numbers to the pursuits of the dedicated spotters who participate in cabbing, shed bashing and haulage bashing. The latter is perhaps the ultimate, as it involves travelling behind as many locomotives as possible, a time-consuming and expensive pastime. Photography is an important component of the hobby and became increasingly popular with advances in camera technology and image processing. Photographs often hold an important clue towards pinning a date to a picture because the liveries of locomotives are often changed during the course of their lives. Some spotters travel huge distances to chase down elusive locos or to venture into unknown territory, where previously unseen locomotive classes can be found. It is an all-consuming passion that is limited only by the spotter's finances and ability to travel. But what is the fascination of loco spotting? It is more than just collecting numbers. Locomotives can have interesting names. There are livery variations different forms and classifications of power, and a life cycle to follow. New builds, modifications, withdrawals, and fate. Was the loco scrapped, or one of the lucky few that was preserved? My own association with the pastime began when I was a mere four years of age. My great-grandfather lived in Aberdeen, and his influence as an engine driver filtered down to my father, who in turn passed it on to me. My first school, Poppleton Road Primary, was alongside the main line at York, not far from the huge loco shed and roundhouse that is now the home of the National Railway Museum. So it is not surprising that at such an early age, the sight and sound of steam engines pounding up and down the East Coast main line became a fascination. It wasn't long before a trip to the loco shed or a few hours spent on the end of a platform at York Station became a regular weekend event. Those experiences had a huge impact on me as a young lad. I was quickly absorbed by the intrigue of such mighty machines, their numbers and their names. I have no doubt that there was an incidental education process going on too, because my knowledge of obscure things like the names of famous racehorses, breeds of duck, and species of antelopes, to name but a few, were second to none, all because I knew them from the lists of locomotives in my ABCs. Many years on, I can still impress family members 
by answering questions correctly on these subjects during TV quiz shows. Loco spotting lost its appeal for me after steam locomotives were withdrawn. But the preservation scene and railway modelling have helped to keep the spark alive. I started drawing and painting locomotives when I was in my teens. There was an inner desire to capture the elegance and technical marvel that certain locomotives had impressed upon me. Over subsequent years, I progressed from painting locomotives that I had known and admired to others that had made an impact in their own way. This book portrays a collection of some of those artworks and provides a broad sample of the locomotive designs that have graced British Rail's for over 200 years. It is hoped that they, and the accompanying text, will help to explain to the reader why they have given the loco spotter so much drive, intrigue and pleasure. Liveries The history of liveries on Britain's railways is a complex subject that deserves a book in its own right. The purpose of this small section is to provide the reader with a little knowledge of the subject when relating to the locomotives that are featured in this book. There are numerous books and websites on the subject for those who want to explore this subject in more detail. A livery portrays the corporate image of the railway company, a selection of colours often accompanied by stylized lettering, lining and numbering, and crests or coats of arms. A distinctive font can also form a part of the identity. For example, the Jill Sands font was introduced by the London and North Eastern Railway in the early 1930s and was later adopted by British Railways. This was superseded by Rail Alphabet, a typeface designed specifically for British Railways during their rebranding in the late 1960s. Colours are generally picked for their conspicuity, or lack of, for example wartime black, and their ability to remain looking clean a difficult requirement for a steam locomotive. Before 1923, there was a multitude of different railway companies with extremely colourful liveries, and the absence of colour photography during this period can make research into particular liveries problematical. Between 1923 and 1947, there were only four major railway companies, known as the Big Four, and this reduced the number of different liveries considerably. This era included prestige trains such as the Coronation and the Silver Jubilee, which introduced striking liveries for both their locomotives and coaches. The Big Four were united under the umbrella of British Railways after nationalisation on 1st of January 1948. This reduced the number of liveries even further and after a number of experimental liveries were trialled, the railway executive settled for simple uniformity, with express passenger and other mainline steam locomotives being painted dark green, and all other engines being painted black. Lining was applied in most cases, except on shunting and freight locomotives, which provided a less austere look. Diesel locomotives were generally painted dark green. But there were a few exceptions, and 25 KVA AC electric locomotives were painted in a colour known as electric blue. The situation remained unchanged until the mid-1960s, when a radical new look heralded the end of the steam era. The introduction of a plain blue livery, known as rail blue, on locomotives and a blue-grey livery for passenger coaches, marked the beginning of a modern image under the brand name of British Rail and the iconic double arrow symbol. A little later, the Total Operations Processing System, TOPS for short, was adopted. TOPS is a computer system for managing locomotives and rolling stock that is still in use. In the mid-1980s, a new intercity livery dark grey and beige with red and white bands, was introduced along with a number of regional colour schemes such as Network Southeast and ScotRail. Around this time, special liveries were also introduced for rail freight locomotives. Initially, this was a drab-looking plain grey 
with a red stripe, but evolved into a striking triple grey scheme, embellished with colourful freight subsector symbols and cast depot plaques. Specific liveries were also introduced for the civil engineers department and parcels sector. In 1994, British Rail was privatised, which resulted in an explosion of new liveries and marked the beginning of another new era. Since then, there have been approximately 200 different liveries, but some of these have been short-lived due to franchising or the amalgamation of companies. Those that have prevailed include the passenger services served by the first group, Virgin Trains, Arriva Trains Wales, Arriva Cross Country, Chiltern Railways, East Midland Trains, Abellio ScotRail and Abellio Greater Anglia. In parallel, full privatisation of freight operations saw the emergence of the English, Welsh and Scottish Railway, subsequently purchased by DB Schenker, Freightliner, Direct Rail Service and GB Rail Freight. There are a number of smaller companies who also have access to the British Railway Network and together they bring a splash of colour and a variety of liveries not seen since the early 20th century. In stark contrast to these early days, modern locomotive liveries may also include intricate graphics applied on vinyl, website addresses, advertising and sponsorship. All a sign of the times. Puffing Billy Puffing Billy is the world's oldest surviving steam locomotive. It was built in 1813 by William Headley, Jonathan Forster and Timothy Hackworth to replace horses on the Wylam Colliery to Leamington on Tyne Wagonway in Northumberland. Its success was pivotal in promoting the use of steam locomotives as a method of hauling coal at other collieries and in the development of mechanical transportation in general. Puffing Billy incorporated a number of novel features such as vertical cylinders and piston rods that extended upwards to pivoted beams. These were connected by rods to a crankshaft beneath the frames from which gears drove and coupled the wheels. The locomotive remained in service until 1862 when it was lent and later sold to the Science Museum in London where it remains on display. Two similar locomotives were built, and one named Willem Dilly, which continued to operate until the early 1880s, can be seen in the Royal Museum, Edinburgh. There is a working replica at the Beamish Museum, and another replica is in the Transport Museum, Munich. Locomotion. Locomotion was the first steam locomotive to haul a passenger train on a public railway. The engine was driven by its designer, George Stevenson, and ran on the Stockton and Darlington Railway on the 27th of September, 1825. It was originally called Active and was the first locomotive to use coupling rods rather than gears to connect its wheels. On the 1st of July, 1828, Locomotion's boiler exploded at Aycliffe Lane, killing the driver and maiming the water pumper. The engine was rebuilt, but as locomotive development was advancing rapidly at the time, it soon became obsolete. After being withdrawn from service in 1841, locomotion was used as a pumping engine until 1857. It was then put on public display and steamed on special occasions, including the Golden Jubilee of the Stockton and Darlington Railway in 1875, and the Stevenson Centenary, in 1881. Between 1892 and 1975, it was on display at Darlington Station. Following its success, a number of similar locomotives were built, but it is the only one to have survived. Rocket. Rocket was a prototype locomotive built for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway's Rainhill Trials, a competition with a £500 prize that was held in 1829 to determine the best form of power for the railway. Up until this time, locomotives had been designed for use at collieries and for short journeys, 
so the challenge was to build an engine that was capable of hauling passengers at a reasonable speed between towns and cities. Four other locomotives took part, but Rocket was the outright winner. In comparison to other designs, it was light, fast and powerful. The key to Rocket's victory was the bringing together of a number of features to improve steaming. This included the use of a multiple tube boiler, which went on to become standard practice for locomotives throughout the steam era. Following Rocket's success, a number of similar engines were built and the Liverpool and Manchester Railway became the world's first intercity railway. Rocket was retired in 1834, but spent a further 10 years working on a colliery line in Cumberland. Firefly. In the early years, when there was no overall plan for the development of the railways, different gauges of track were being used. Between London and Bristol, Isambard Kingdom Brunel pioneered a broad gauge, seven foot and a quarter inch track for the Great Western Railway. Firefly was the first of a class of 62 locomotives built between 1840 and 1842 for passenger services on that line. Broad gauge allowed for much faster speeds than had previously been achieved, and the class gave performances that were the best in the world at the time. On the 13th of June, 1842, one member of the class, Felgerthon, hauled the first royal train from Slough to London with Queen Victoria on board, and in 1845, another class member, Ixion, was officially recorded at 61 miles per hour during trials. Broad gauge was abandoned in favour of standard gauge, four foot eight and a half inches in 1892. An operational replica of Firefly was built by the Firefly Trust and has operated on a short stretch of broad gauge line at Didcot Railway Centre since 2005. Old Copper Knob. The Furness Railway was an independent railway that was conceived to meet the ends of transporting iron ore and slate from the mines and quarries of the Furness Peninsula in Cumbria. The railway was instrumental in the development of the region's iron, steel and shipbuilding industries. Old Copper Knob was the third of four locomotives built for the first passenger services on the railway. The first two were built in 1844 and the second two were built in 1846. The design became known as the Berry type, after their designer, Edward Berry. Many of its features, such as the inside horizontal cylinders and wrought iron frames, underpinned future locomotive designs. It had a much cleaner and modern look than previous designs, although without a cab, the footplate crew was still fully exposed to the elements. The nickname Old Copper Knob originates from the prominent dome-shaped copper firebox. The locomotives were built in Liverpool and delivered by boat to Peel Island on the southern tip of the Furness Peninsula. Number three hauled the first passenger train on the railway on August the 24th, 1846, and is the only survivor of the class. As newer and faster locomotives were introduced, these venerable machines were relegated to freight duties, hauling iron ore and slate between the mines, the ironworks, the steelworks and the docks. Old Copper Knob's last operational days were spent as a shunter at Barrow Docks, where it continued to give service until December 1898, by which time it was the oldest operational locomotive in the country. Following withdrawal from service, it went on display in a large glass case at Barrow Central Station. However, during the Blitz in 1941, a German bomb fell on the station, and scars from the shrapnel can still be seen on the locomotive today. Following this, it was put into store, but was later moved to the British Museum of Transport, London. In 1975, it was moved to York, and is now part of the National Collection. It was returned to steam in 1996 to take part in the celebrations for the 150th anniversary of the Furness Railway. Sterling Single Technological advances, competition 
and widespread expansion of the railway lines led to a rapid development of locomotive designs in the second half of the 19th century. In the 1800s, some designers believed that large driving wheels were necessary to achieve high speeds through better adhesion. Patrick Sterling was such a man, and he produced one of the most striking and elegant locomotive types to emerge in this period. It was the Great Northern Railway Class G, designed for the high-speed express services between London and York, which included the Flying Scotsman. Due to their prominent eight-foot driving wheels, they became affectionately known as the Stirling Singles, and had the power to haul up to 26 carriages at high average speeds. They were also nicknamed eight-footers, and were the fastest locomotives in the country at the time. 37 Class Gs were built between 1870 and 1883. These were followed by 16 similar locomotives, Class G1 and G2, with the last 10 having larger boilers and pistons. In 1888, there was an unofficial race to the north between the rival East and West Coast Railway companies. Sterling Singles excelled and recorded top speeds of up to 85 miles per hour with average speeds of 58 miles per hour between London and York. The Stirling Singles had long successful lives, but the introduction of larger and heavier coaches from 1895 put too much demand on them, and they were replaced on express duties by more modern designs. Number one was withdrawn from service in 1907, although other members of the class survived until 1916 and it was retained for preservation. Originally in the Old Railway Museum, York, and later in the National Railway Museum. In 1938, it was returned to steam to haul a special train to mark the 50th anniversary of the Race to the North, and for an excursion from London to Cambridge for railway enthusiasts. In 1975, the locomotive took part in the Rail 150 Cavalcade of Steam at Shildon, and spent almost a year operating on the Great Central Railway in the early 1980s. Stroudley Class A1 Terrier The Stroudley Class A1 tank locomotives hold a unique place in British locomotive history due to their persistence and longevity. They were introduced in 1872 and played a key role in the drive towards standardisation. Although considered obsolete at the turn of the 19th century, many soldiered on, and several were still operating in the early 1960s. Designed by William Stroudley, these diminutive but powerful tank locomotives were built to meet the needs of the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway. A total of 50 were constructed at Brighton Works between 1872 and 1880. The locomotives acquired the nickname Terrier due to the bark of their exhaust. Initially, the class were employed on frequent, short-distance commuter services. Some were used on the East London Line and travelled under the River Thames via the Thames Tunnel. The expansion of the commuter belt to towns such as Croydon can be attributed largely to the Terriers, as their speed allowed people to work further from the centre of London. They were such reliable and versatile performers that when commuter trains became heavier and they were displaced from these duties, the class found useful employment on branch lines and shunting duties. When withdrawn by the LBSCR, many of the class were sold to other railway companies, including four to the Isle of Wight Railway, and a few were put to use at locomotive and carriage works. 22 members of the class were rebuilt between 1911 and 1943 with new boilers, extended smoke boxes and other refinements. These were known as the Class A1X. In 1960, number 32655, formerly number 55, Stepney, was purchased from British Railways and became the first steam locomotive to enter service on a standard gauge preserve line in Great Britain. The last scheduled passenger services for the class on British Railways was on the Hailing Island branch, which continued to use the Terriers until November 1963. One of those engines, number 32636, 
formerly number 72 Fenchurch, had the distinction of being the oldest operational locomotive on British railways at 91 years of age. Caledonian Single The Caledonian Railway was a major Scottish railway company that was formed to connect the railways of Scotland and England. Its development was rapid, and from the 15th of February 1848 it became possible to travel on a continuous line between London and Glasgow. A network of branch and commuter lines soon emerged from the principal routes. The Caledonian Single was an engine that had a stroke of remarkably good fortune. It was built with the sole purpose of being the Caledonian Railway's star exhibit at the Edinburgh International Exhibition in 1886. It featured a single, large driving wheel, similar to that of the Stirling single, but this wheel arrangement was never adopted by the Caledonian Railway, and the locomotive remained unique. After entering service, the locomotive was found to give excellent performances, particularly on routes with steep gradients. During the unofficial race to the north in 1888, it was charged with taking the West Coast train forward from Carlisle to Edinburgh, a journey of 101 miles, which it covered comfortably in a little over 100 minutes. Also known as Cayley 123, this unique and famous engine went on to give several years of useful service on routine passenger routes between Edinburgh, Carlisle and Glasgow, before being relegated to more sedate duties. As such, it was notable for being given the honour of the Royal Train Pilot during the reign of three monarchs, Queen Victoria, King Edward VII and King George V. In 1923, when the Caledonian Railway became absorbed into the London Midland and Scottish Railway, the locomotive was painted Midland Red and given the number 14010. Retirement came in 1935, by which time the locomotive had gained the distinction of being the last single driving wheel express locomotive to run in Great Britain. It was an obvious candidate for preservation and was initially stored at St Rollox, Glasgow. In 1958, the locomotive was returned to operational condition and hauled several special trains and rail tours before being retired as museum exhibit in 1965. Dean Single The Great Western Railway was still using broad gauge track when its chief mechanical engineer, William Dean, introduced his new express passenger locomotives in 1891. However, plans were already in place to adopt the standard gauge, so his locomotives were built initially as convertibles with a 222 wheel arrangement. The first eight of the class had this unusual feature, which required the wheels to be on the outside of the frames. As was common practice at the time, the design featured a large 7 foot 8.5 inch single driving wheel, and they became known as the Dean Singles. They were converted to standard gauge in 1892 by shortening the axles and placing the wheels inside the frames. The next 22 locomotives were built as standard gauge from new, but the modified arrangement made the weight of the locomotives unbalanced and they were unsteady at speed. A major modification followed which lengthened the frames and introduced a leading bogey to allow 422 wheel arrangement. This transformation gave the class a more elegant and graceful appearance. A further 50 locomotives were built to this specification between 1894 and 1899, bringing the total number of the class to 80. They were also known as the GWR 3031 class, after the first locomotive to be built and Achilles class. The class was the mainstay of traction for the London to West England expresses during the first decade of the 20th century. Despite a number of modifications and improvements during their lives, they were eventually ousted by more powerful classes and were put in charge of the less demanding services between London, Birmingham and Wolverhampton. Two Dean Singles were selected for royal train duties during Queen Victoria's Jubilee celebrations in 1897, and one, number 3041, was specially renamed the Queen 
A full-size, non-working replica of this locomotive was built in 1982 for a Railways and Royalty exhibition, and is now on display at Windsor Station, albeit without a tender. Armstrong Class The Great Western Railway produced some of the most elegant steam locomotives of all time, and their appearance was further enhanced by eye-catching liveries. Following on from the graceful Dean Singles came another masterpiece of late 19th century engineering, in the form of the Armstrong class. Only four were built, and they were all rebuilt of older designs. Three were originally broad gauge locomotives. They represented an important advance on locomotive design, as they set the benchmark for a range of 440 inside cylinder locomotives that were introduced in the following years. The Armstrongs were coupled to the same type of tender as those attached to the Dean Singles, which incorporated a simple type of condensing apparatus to return water to the tank, while also providing a method of preheating the water. The four locomotives kept their original numbers, 7, 8, 14 and 16 and were named after prominent figures in the GWR. Armstrong, Gooch, Charles Saunders, and Brunel. Initially, they were put to work on the London to Bristol line alongside the Dean Singles. But from around 1910, they were moved to Wolverhampton to work the express services that ran north from there. Between 1905 and 1911, all four locomotives were rebuilt extensively, with new boilers and fireboxes. They were rebuilt again in 1915, this time with smaller driving wheels and a larger tapered boiler. Following this modification, the four locomotives were incorporated into the GWR 4100 class and were renumbered 4169 to 4172 to conform to the GWR locomotive numbering system that was evolving at that time. By the end of their working lives, very little of the original components of these engines remained. They were all withdrawn between 1928 and 1930, their place being succeeded by more powerful 460 designs such as the Castle class. Sadly, despite their complex histories and significant role in locomotive development, none of these graceful and purposeful machines were preserved, and all four were scrapped. Drummond T9 class By the end of the 19th century, the 440 wheel arrangement that had been pioneered by the designers of the Great Western Railway had become widely adopted for express locomotive designs by other railway companies. The London and South Western Railway was no exception but their initial design was not powerful enough to cope with the increasing weight of passenger trains. Dougal Drummond, a Scottish railway engineer who had taken up an appointment with the LSWR in 1895, was instrumental in their development, and his most successful design emerged in 1899. It was known as the T9 class, and the power and speed of these locomotives soon earned them the nickname Greyhounds. An initial order for 65 locomotives was placed, and an additional member of the class was built for display at the Glasgow Exhibition in 1901. Building took place at both the LSWR Works at Nine Elms, London, and the Dubs & Co Works, Glasgow. Initially, the T9s were delivered with six-wheeled tenders that could carry four tonnes of coal and 3,500 gallons of water. However, on some routes, this allowed very little surplus of water, so a new eight-wheeled tender, known as a water cart, capable of carrying 4,000 gallons, was introduced. With this tender, the T9s could cover all the key routes from London to destinations in the southwest, including Portsmouth and Exeter. Engines fitted with the smaller six-wheel tender still found useful employment on express services to the Kent and Sussex coasts. During the course of their long and successful lives, the T9s received a number of improvements, including the fitting of superheaters. Some locomotives also received a replacement chimney, known as a stovepipe, which was shorter than the original 
and allowed the class to run on lines that had a lower loading gauge. In 1947, 13 T9s were converted to oil burning, but this unsuccessful experiment led to their early demise. The majority of the class were withdrawn in the 1950s, but a few remained operational in the early 1960s. Midland Compound A compound steam engine is one in which steam is expanded to improve the efficiency of the fuel and water. The steam is used more than once, first in a high pressure cylinder and then in lower pressure cylinders. Invented in 1781, this type of engine was used extensively in textile mills and ships, but it was not until the later part of the 19th century that they found favour in British locomotive designs. An engineer named Francis Webb produced a number of compound locomotives for the London and North Western Railway, the first entering service in 1882. The North Eastern Railway also employed compound locomotive designs in the 1890s. However, it was the Midland Railway that, in 1902, introduced two prototype compound locomotives that were to underpin the most successful British compound design of all. These were designed by Samuel Johnson and were heavily based on the NER design. They were an immediate success, acquitting themselves well on the demanding route between Leeds and Carlisle. The following year, three similar locomotives were built, and these were put to work on services between London, Nottingham, Leicester and Derby. Appropriately, they became known as the Midland Compounds. Johnson's successor, Richard Dealey, made improvements that simplified the original design and incorporated a larger firebox. Forty locomotives were built to the specification between 1905 and 1909. In 1913, a superheated boiler was fitted to one of these engines, and this offered further efficiencies. As a consequence, all members of the class were similarly modified. On formation of the London, Midland and Scottish Railway in 1923, the Midland compound was adopted as the standard express locomotive, and a further 190 were built between 1924 and 1927. Despite an early decline in enthusiasm for the compound steam locomotive, the introduction of superheaters ensured that the Midland compounds remained in widespread service across the LMS and later BR until their withdrawal in the 1950s. City class. During the latter half of the 19th century, the Great Western Railway built some very successful engines with single driving wheels, but they struggled to cope with the demands of increasingly heavier passenger trains. Designers therefore turned to 440 designs, and some of these were modified in attempts to improve performance. This included the Atbara class, which evolved into the City class. Their most notable feature was a mix of traditional design, double frames and inside cylinders, with a modern tapered boiler and large firebox. Building of the first 10 locomotives began at Swindon in 1903, and they were joined by 10 converted Atbara class locomotives between 1907 and 1909. They were also known as the 3700 class, and worked predominantly on the express routes between Plymouth and London. These fine engines marked an important point in British locomotive development as they were the foundation of designs that would dominate the 20th century. From around 1910, superheaters were fitted, which gave improved performance. But despite their success and popularity, the city class was quickly overshadowed by the GWR's emerging powerful 460 express locomotives. One member of the class, number 3440, City of Truro, the 2000th locomotive built at Swindon Works is claimed to have attained an unofficial speed in excess of 100 miles per hour. It was recorded on a stopwatch by railway journalist Charles Russ Martin while travelling on the Bristol to Plymouth Ocean Mails train on the 9th of May 1904. The claim has been subject to much controversy, but it enabled the locomotive to acquire a lasting fame and it was preserved as a result. In preservation, City of Truro has led an active life. 
It was withdrawn in 1931, but was brought out of retirement in 1951 for regular service on BR's western region between Didcot and Southampton. In 1961, it was withdrawn once again and displayed in the GWR Museum, Swindon. The locomotive was given further reprieves in 1984 and 2004, when it enjoyed long spells of running on the main line and at Heritage Railways. NBR K-Class The North British Railway was opened in 1846 and controlled the lines in much of eastern and southern Scotland. It developed more by a process of amalgamation among existing companies than of expansion. Its network was centred on Edinburgh and had routes into England via Berwick-upon-Tweed and Carlisle, which led to an intense rivalry with the Caledonian Railway. In 1890, the opening of the fourth bridge allowed through services to Dundee and Aberdeen, giving the NBR a significant advantage. William Reed, who began his career as an apprentice at the NBR works in 1879, gained considerable experience of locomotive development and became locomotive superintendent between 1903 and 1919. He designed a number of locomotives and the K-Class was the final development of his 440 mixed traffic types. They were based on his earlier J-Class and were built at the NBR Cowles works over a seven year period. They had superheated boilers and were named after Scottish glens, which earned them the nickname the Glens. The class saw extensive use on the West Highland Line, Glasgow to Fort William and Malag, which had been acquired by the NBR in 1908. Here they coped admirably on the steeply graded and twisting track, although double heading was often required on heavier trains. Eventually, they were deployed all over the NBR network and put in some fine performances on express services between Edinburgh, Glasgow and Dundee. In addition, they were a common sight on excursions, football specials and troop trains. When the NBR became a constituent of the LNER in 1923, the class became known as the D34. Gradually they were succeeded by the more modern and powerful Gresley and Thompson locomotives. Withdrawals began as early as 1946, but the majority of the class survived until the late 1950s, and the last five were withdrawn in 1961. One example has been preserved, number 256, Glen Douglas. It was restored and kept in working order until 1965, before taking up residence in the Glasgow Museum of Transport, now Riverside Museum. King Arthur class. Many British locomotive classes evolved through improvements to existing designs. The class N15 was a classic example of this philosophy and it had a complex history. It was based on the successful and robust mixed traffic locomotive known as the H15, which had been introduced by Robert Urey in 1913 for the London and South Western Railway. Yuri developed this design into an express passenger locomotive in 1916. But due to the manufacturing demands of World War I, building did not commence until 1918. The N15 was a bigger engine all round, with 7 foot 6 inch driving wheels, larger cylinders and a taper boiler. It was coupled to an 8 wheel tender that had a capacity of 5,000 gallons of water and 5 tonnes of coal which gave considerable range. 20 of these impressive looking machines were built for use on the LSWR's express services and were all absorbed into the Southern Railway in 1923. However, the N15 struggled on the more demanding routes. So the SR's chief mechanical engineer, Richard Mortsall, modified them by providing more efficient drafting and a better steaming capability. Due to a shortage of express motive power, the SR ordered a further 54 locomotives of the improved design. These were built in three batches between 1925 and 1927. The first batch included conversions from previous classes. The second batch was built by the North British Locomotive Company in Glasgow, and the third batch was built at the SR's Eastleigh Works. For publicity purposes, 
They were named after characters from the legend of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. They became known as the King Arthur class, and depending on their origin, they were nicknamed the Uri Arthurs and the Scotch Arthurs and the Eastley Arthurs. In 1926, they became the first British locomotive class to be fitted with smoke deflectors. The King Arthurs were dependable locomotives that gained praise for their excellent acceleration and high speed. They were the mainstay of power for express services on the SR until demoted to secondary duties by the introduction of the bullied Pacifics in the late 1940s. Improved Director Class In 1899, the Great Central Railway was the last of the major railway companies to reach London Marylebone. As its name implied, the GCR's main lines were sandwiched between other major routes to the east and west of the country, and its principal destinations were Nottingham, Manchester and Sheffield. In places, it had long, demanding gradients, which meant that the trains had to run with light loadings. The company's locomotive superintendent, John G. Robinson, recognised the need for more powerful express locomotives, and one of his more successful designs was the Class 11E. These were introduced in 1913, and became known as the Director Class, but only ten were built before the onset of World War I. By the time building recommenced in 1919, a number of enhancements had been made to the design, which included improved piston valves and a modern cab. These differences led to the new locomotives being classed as 11F, and they adopted the name Improved Director. Upon the grouping of the Big Four in 1923, the London and North Eastern Railway inherited the class and saw them as ideal engines to fulfil their requirement for express passenger locomotives on the former North British Railway lines. A further batch of 24 locomotives was built in 1924. But these engines had lower cabs, chimneys and boiler mountings to allow them to travel on more restrictive lines. The LNER classified these engines D11-2, the former GCR locomotives becoming D11-1. Such was the popularity of the class that they were used on some Pullman services between 1927 and 1932. Although a distinctly old-fashioned design, the improved directors continued to find work in the Midlands and Scotland up until the 1950s. The introduction of the Thompson class B1s eventually displaced them, but many spent considerable time in storage being held in reserve. Withdrawals commenced at the end of 1958, and the last was taken out of service at Edinburgh Haymarket Shed in early 1962. Only one escaped scrapping, number 506 Butler Henderson, the first Class 11F to be built. It is the only surviving GCR express passenger locomotive. GNSR Class F The Great North of Scotland Railway covered the northeast of Scotland and was opened in 1854. From Aberdeen it went to Elgin, Fraserburgh and Ballater and had a network of branch lines. Its locomotive construction and repair works was based at Inverurie, but only two classes were built there, the Class V and Class F. The Class V had been introduced by William Pickersgill in 1899, and when the GNSR needed to replace some of its ageing locomotive fleet after World War I, Pickersgill's successor, Thomas Haywood, introduced a superheated version known as the Class F. It was one of the GNSR's last designs, and eight were built for mixed traffic duties between 1920 and 1921. Six were built by the North British Locomotive Company in Glasgow, and two were built at Inverurie Works. They were the best passenger locomotives the GNSR ever owned, and were the only ones to receive names. One member of the class, number 49, was temporarily fitted with scarab oil burning equipment during the coal miners' strike in 1921. The GNSR became part of the London and North Eastern Railway after the railway grouping of 1923. When taken into LNER stock, Class F became Class D40, along with 13 other examples of GNSR's older Class V. In 1925, 
A notable duty for the class was double-heading on the royal train when conveying royalty to Balmoral Castle via the Deceed Line. Seven members of the class passed into British Railways ownership in 1948, and the last was withdrawn in 1958. By this time, the class had been relegated to secondary duties after the introduction of the LNER class B-12s and B-1s. The last operational locomotive, number 62277, formerly GNSR number 49, Gordon Highlander, had been allocated to Kitty Brewster Shed, Aberdeen, throughout most of its working life, but ended its days on the Speyside Line. After retirement, it was restored back to GNSR livery, although not its original black and hauled a number of special trains until it was retired to the Glasgow Museum of Transport in 1966. More recently, it was moved to the Scottish Railway Museum at Bowness. Gresley Class N2 Nigel Gresley designed the Class N2 tank locomotive to meet a motive power requirement for heavy commuter trains in the post-World War I period. The N2 was based on the highly successful Ivet class N1 tank locomotive that dated back to 1907. The N2 had larger cylinders and piston valves, greater water capacity and a superheated boiler. Due to their acceleration and relatively high speed, the class was an immediate success and they were put to work on the King's Cross suburban services. Members of the class also found their way to Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dundee to perform similar duties, and some were allocated to the sheds in Yorkshire. A notable feature for some of the London-based N2 tanks was a squat chimney and condensing equipment, which enabled them to run on underground lines between King's Cross and Moorgate. The introduction of diesels on the suburban services in the late 1950s forced the N2s into redundancy, and all but one was scrapped. Fowler Class 3F Ginty. When the London Midland and Scottish Railway formed in 1923, it adopted the Midland Railway's 1900 class tank locomotive as a template for a new standard shunting locomotive, which became known as the Fowler Class 3F. Initially, they were nicknamed Jockos, but Ginty became more favourable in later years. The design, which dated back to the late 1890s, was given only minor changes and was built in large quantities by a number of different contractors over an eight-year period. They proved to be reliable and versatile little engines and soon found their work expanding beyond shunting. Some were equipped with carriage heating capability, which allowed them to be employed on local and suburban passenger services. They were widespread across the LMS network and seven were built exclusively for use on the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. Eight members of the class were acquired by the War Department in 1940 and saw service in France. Three were destroyed during hostilities, and the remaining five were repatriated to the LMS. Castle Class When introduced in 1923, The Great Western Railway's Castle Class claimed to be the most powerful express locomotive in Great Britain. This caused much controversy and led to a locomotive exchange in 1925 between the Great Western Railway and London and North East Railway in order that a comparison could be made with the larger Gresley A1 Pacifics. The castles acquitted themselves well and proved to be more powerful and efficient. A similar evaluation took place in 1926 with the LMS, and once again the GWR design outperformed its rivals. The success of the Castle class was put down to a design that had evolved from the Star class. It incorporated four cylinders, a 460 wheel arrangement with good weight distribution, and a tapered boiler and bell pair firebox. Many subsequent classes of steam locomotive were influenced by the Castle class including the Gresley A3 Pacifics, the Stanier Black Fives, and some of the British Railway Standard Classes. The castles gave superb performances over demanding routes and quickly established themselves on prestigious services. This included the Cheltenham Flyer, which from 1932 
was scheduled to cover 77.3 miles from Swindon to Paddington in just 65 minutes, and which required an average speed of over 71 miles per hour, the world's fastest train at that time. Other notable services that the castles were entrusted with included the Bristolian and Torbay Express. Such was their versatility that they could be seen just about anywhere on the GWR's main lines, and they were also put in charge of express freight. During the course of their working lives, the castles received a number of modifications that further improved their performance. Most notably, the use of larger superheaters and double blast pipes provided a little more power and better steaming with poor coal. The original 3,500 gallon tender was soon replaced by a 4,000 gallon version, of which there were two types, one designed by Collett and a flush-sided design introduced in the latter years by Hawksworth. Eight members of the class have survived into preservation and several of them had ventured back onto the main line. Lord Nelson class. The mid-1920s was an important period in British locomotive history, when the big four companies produced some exceptional locomotives. In particular, their new express passenger designs were large, powerful and impressive machines. Among these, the Southern Railway had introduced the King Arthur class, but they could not meet the demands of the heavy expresses that were expected to exceed 500 tonnes. Richard Maunsell's challenge was to build a more powerful engine than the King Arthur, while keeping the weight down due to the Southern Line's restrictions. A skillful and well-balanced design ensured that when the first of his new locomotives took the rails in 1926, it was the most powerful locomotive in Britain. The first locomotive in the class was named Lord Nelson, and it was tested thoroughly for two years before any further were built. The design was unusual in giving eight exhaust beats per revolution instead of the customary four, due to the driving axle cranks being set at 135 degrees instead of the usual 90 degrees, which gave a more even transmission of power. However, they did not live up to expectations due to poor steaming, and it was not until over a decade later that modifications to the blast pipe and the chimney enabled their full potential to be realised. Primary duties for the Lord Nelsons included the continental boat trains between Victoria and Dover and express services from Waterloo to the southwest. The class received a number of modifications during their lives. Smoke deflectors were fitted from 1929 and new cylinders were introduced from 1939. One locomotive, number 859, was given smaller driving wheels and another, number 860, was given a longer boiler as experiments to improve their performance, but neither offered any significant advantage. Over the course of their lives, the locomotives were also coupled to a variety of types of tender, including a six-wheel version, but all ended up with a high-sided, self-trimming, eight-wheel tenders. Although the introduction of the Bully Pacifics in 1941 stole their limelight, the Lord Nelsons continued to give reliable service until their withdrawal in 1961 to 1962. Royal Scot Class When formed in 1923, the London, Midland and Scottish Railway faced a dilemma. It had inherited nearly 10,000 locomotives from around 400 classes but none of them was powerful enough to cope with the heavy expresses that were being introduced on the West Coast main line. There was an intense rivalry with the London and North Eastern Railway to gain the fastest journey times between London and Scotland, and the shortfall had to be addressed urgently. The company's chief mechanical engineer, Henry Fowler, began designing a compound Pacific, but after trials with the Great Western Railway Castle Class locomotive on the LMS in 1926, it was abandoned. The LMS hierarchy was so impressed by the performance of the castle class that they attempted to purchase 50, but this was rejected. However, they successfully obtained plans of the Lord Nelson class from the Southern Railway, and many similarities in design could be seen when the LMS produced its own powerful 460 express locomotive. A contract to build 50 locomotives was placed with the North British Locomotive Company, Glasgow, who worked jointly with the LMS to finalise the design. The first engine emerged in 1927 and was named Royal Scott 
from which the class took its name. The class entered service immediately and, despite some early weaknesses, put in five performances on express services between London and the North West, a responsibility they held until the mid-1930s. A further 20 were ordered in 1930 and these were built at Derby Works. In 1933, one member of the class, renamed and renumbered as the original Royal Scot, conducted a tour of major North American cities and was displayed at an international exhibition in Chicago. Between 1943 and 1955, the class was substantially rebuilt with tapered boilers, new frames and cylinders, which gave them a more modern appearance and a new lease of life. All were operational in the early 1960s, and the last was withdrawn in December 1965. King Class The Great Western Railway responded quickly when its castle class lost the honour of being the most powerful locomotives in Britain, following the introduction of the Southern Railway's Lord Nelson class in 1926. By this time, track and infrastructure improvements had allowed heavier designs to be considered for use on the GWR's principal routes. So Charles Collett set about designing the natural successor to his highly successful castles. The result, dubbed the Super Castle, was a locomotive with a large boiler and cylinders, yet smaller diameter driving wheels to improve adhesion. The prototype was built with great haste in 1927, so that it could be sent to the USA to participate in the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad centenary celebrations. The original intention was to name the class after British cathedrals, but in light of the publicity to be gained from this high-profile visit, it decided to be named the first engine after the reigning monarch, King George V. With the attractive effort of over £40,000, the King class, as it became known, was capable of over 100 miles per hour, and the GWR regained the prestigious title that the castles had recently lost. King George V was a star attraction in the USA and returned with commemorative plaques and a large bell, which have remained on the engine ever since. Initially, a total of 30 locomotives were built, and they were put in charge of the top link expresses between London, Plymouth and Wolverhampton. Some of their best performances were over the demanding South Devon banks. In 1936, one locomotive, number 6007, King William III, was written off following a serious accident at Shrivenham, and had to be substantially rebuilt. The outward appearance of the kings changed little during their lives, the fitting of a double chimney from 1955 being the most obvious modification. Others included improved superheaters and mechanical lubricators. Following a major refurbishment program in the mid-1950s, the kings continued to reign supreme on the former GWR lines of British railways until replaced by the introduction of diesel hydraulic locomotives in 1962. Gresley Class A3 The Gresley Class A3 Pacifics were an evolution of the Gresley Class A1 Pacifics that were introduced in 1922. Although they shared the same chassis design, they were fitted with higher pressure boilers and cabs with left-hand drive to improve the driver's sighting of signals. 27 A3s were built from scratch and 51 were later converted from A1s. Flying Scotsman was one of the latter. It was also one of the first locomotives to be coupled to the innovative corridor tender which allowed crews to change over en route through a connection with the leading carriage. From 1928, this allowed the first non-stop running of services between London and Scotland. Most of the class were named after famous racehorses, but Flying Scotsman was one of the few exceptions, as it was named after the train that had been running since 1862. The naming took place prior to the locomotive being put on display at the British Empire Exhibition in 1924. The A3s were elegant and well-proportioned locomotives that could reach speeds of 100 miles per hour plus. Indeed, it was Flying Scotsman, as a modified Class A1, that went on to be credited with the world's first officially recorded speed of 100 miles per hour on the 30th of November 1934. This claim to fame was short-lived, as a few months later, another A3 
number 2750, Papyrus reached a top speed of 108 miles per hour between Newcastle and King's Cross. Gresley Class A3s marked an important chapter in British railway history as they confirmed the need of larger boilers and fireboxes to provide adequate margins of steam and hence power and efficiency for the increasing demands of railway traffic in the early 20th century. In later years, some of the class received improvements that altered their appearance. These modifications included the fitting of a Kilchap double blast pipe and chimney and German-style smoke deflectors. After 40 years of loyal and reliable service, only one member of the class was preserved, the most famous of them all, Flying Scotsman. Hall Class After the formation of the Big Four in 1923, the Great Western Railway was looking for a powerful mixed traffic locomotive to cope with the increasing weight and speed of mainline freight and semi-fast passenger trains. Charles Collett's plan involved rebuilding a St. Class locomotive with smaller driving wheels and a cab similar to the one fitted to the Castle Class. The engine began trials in 1924 and underwent three years of evaluation before the design was finalised. An order was placed for 80 locomotives and they became known as the Hall Class. Deliveries commenced in 1928 and they proved to be so successful that another 20 were ordered and these were followed by several more batches. Building continued until 1943, by which time 258 were in service, one having been destroyed in a bombing raid on Plymouth in 1941. Collett's successor, Frederick Hawksworth, ordered the building of another 71 locomotives to a modified design. These were built between 1943 and 1950 and became known as the Modified Halls. Although very similar in appearance, they incorporated a number of new features brought about by modern manufacturing practices and advances in steam efficiency. The modified halls were delivered with Hawksworth's neater but less elegant tender, but over the course of time, these were interchanged throughout the class with the older Collet version. The halls held the mantle as the GWR's standard mixed traffic locomotive during the steam era, and could be seen all over the network except on lines restricted by their weight. A modified hall, number 6998, Burton Agnes Hall, had the honour of being in charge of the last steam hauled passenger services on BR's western region on the 3rd of January 1966. One of the 18 survivors, number 4942, Mandy Hall, is being rebuilt as a St. Class locomotive, and another, number 7927, Willington Hall is being used as a donor engine for the Grange class and County class new build projects to fill gaps in the list of preserved GWR locomotive classes. 5700 class Pannier Tank The Great Western Railway was unique among the major British railway companies in adopting the Pannier Tank as the design for their standard shunter. The most prolific of these was the 5700 classes which was based on the late 19th century design and had water tanks attached to either side of the boiler as panniers. A space above the running plate allowed ease of maintenance. They enjoyed almost 20 years of uninterrupted construction and became the largest class in the GWR. As most were fitted with carriage heating equipment, these sprightly little engines were ideal for use on branch line passenger services. A few of the class were fitted with condensing apparatus which allowed them to work in the tunnels of London Transport's Metropolitan Line. Although ousted by diesel shunters, many pannier tanks survived until the early 1960s. London Transport purchased 13 from British Railways for use on works trains, and the National Coal Board bought five, giving a few members of the class a new lease of life. 14XX Class Although credited to Charles Collett, the design of the diminutive 14XX class tank locomotive dates back to the 19th century. It was an improved version of the 517 class introduced by George Armstrong in 1868. They were originally known as the 48XX class but were reclassified in 1946. As a sprightly, lightweight tank engine, they were perfect for GWR branch lines and were designed to work with an auto coach. This allowed the driver to control the engine from a cab in the coach, 
and avoided the need to uncouple the engine to run around its train at destinations. The class played a starring role in the film The Titfield Thunderbolt in 1953, where a group of villagers attempt to save their branch line from closure. In the later years, when in British Railways ownership, some of the class were painted in a smart, lined-out passenger livery. However, branch line closures and the introduction of diesel multiple units took their toll, and most had been sent to the scrapyards by the mid-1960s, with only a few saved for preservation. Princess Royal Class The London Midland and Scottish Railway inherited very few powerful express locomotives when it was formed in 1923. The situation was eased by the introduction of the Royal Scot Class in 1927, but they did not match the performance of the Great Western Railway's Castle Class or the London and North Eastern Railway's Class A1. William Stanier, who joined the LMS as its chief mechanical engineer in 1932, put his previous experience with the GWR into designing a Pacific to handle the very heavy and demanding services on the West Coast Main Line between London and Scotland. By mid-1933, the first locomotive had been built, and the GWR influence was obvious, with many dimensions including those of the driving wheels and cylinders being identical to the King class. However, Stanier had included a larger boiler and wider firebox to gain better results from inferior grades of coal. The first two locomotives were named Princess Royal, number 6200, and Princess Elizabeth, number 6201, and they became known as the Princess Royal class, or Lizzie's in railway circles. In 1933, the class was increased to 13, including one, number 6202, which had been built as an experimental turbine-driven engine known as the Turbomotive. It was rebuilt as a conventional locomotive between 1950 and 1952, and named Princess Anne, but was destroyed in a tragic disaster involving a three-train collision at Harrow, only eight weeks after re-entering service. Later modifications to the class included the fitting of more efficient boilers and larger tenders. In 1936, Princess Elizabeth broke the record for the fastest non-stop run between London and Glasgow, a distance of 401.4 miles. It achieved this in under six hours on two consecutive days in both directions, at an average speed of 69 miles per hour. Also in that year, the fastest speed by a member of the class was recorded, 102.5 miles an hour, by number 6203, Princess Margaret Rose. This capability ensured that the Princess Royals remained in charge of top Anglo-Scottish services until they were replaced by diesels in the early 1960s. Stanier Black 5 William Stanier became the chief mechanical engineer of the London Midland and Scottish Railway in 1932. Previously he had served as an assistant chief mechanical engineer for the Great Western Railway and he brought with him a wealth of knowledge about locomotive practice and standardisation. This influence could be clearly seen in his design for a powerful and capable mixed traffic locomotive, with its tapered superheated boiler, large firebox, two cylinders and a 460 wheel arrangement. It closely resembled the GWR Hall class. The LMS called it simply the Stanier Class 5, but later it became known more affectionately as the Black 5. Introduced in 1934, they were relatively simple locomotives with good steaming qualities, an ample tender, economic operation and ease of maintenance. They were highly regarded by railwaymen, and such was their demand that the LMS could not build them fast enough. Construction was farmed out into independent companies, including Armstrong Whitworth of Newcastle, who built 327 of the 842 in the class. Initially, the Black Fives were put to work on the demanding line through the highlands between Perth and Inverness, where they transformed both passenger and freight services. They were highly versatile machines and were widely spread throughout the British railway network, particularly after nationalisation in 1948. With such a large class of locomotives, it is unsurprising that a number received modifications. These were done mainly to improve boiler and valve gear efficiency. Notably, the last two locomotives were built with outside Caparotti valve gear, which required higher running plates above the wheels and cylinders. In 
Together with a double chimney, these two engines had a distinctive appearance that represented the ultimate form of Stania's original masterpiece. The Black Fives were very successful and purposeful machines that outlived other modern designs. Several saw service until the end of steam on British railways. Indeed, the last steam hauled passenger service was credited to a Black Five, number 45110, on August the 11th, 1968. Gresley Class P2 By the early 1930s, the most powerful locomotives in the LNER infantry, the Class A3s, could not cope with the 500 ton plus trains that had been introduced on the route between Edinburgh and Aberdeen. This was due to the line's steep gradients and tight curves. So Nigel Gresley set about designing a more powerful version of the A3 with a 282 wheel arrangement and larger boiler. The first locomotive, number 2001, was built in 1934 and it was designated Class P2. Named Cocker the North, the nickname of a Scottish aristocrat, it was a highly impressive machine, with the streamlined front end to deflect the exhaust from the driver's vision. A few months after entering service, the engine was sent to the French locomotive test facility at Vitry, and although its boiler efficiency proved to be good, the valve gear was found to be uneconomical. The second locomotive was therefore built with more efficient valves, and the first was modified subsequently. The next four locomotives to emerge were built with wedge-shaped front ends, similar to those introduced on the Class A4s. Only six Class P2s were built, and their magnificent appearance was marred by mechanical failures and poor efficiency. In 1943, a controversial rebuilding programme was introduced by Gresley's successor, Edward Thompson. Although many of the original parts were retained, the engines had a very different visual appearance, as they were transformed into 462 Pacifics with shorter frames and boilers. They were reclassed as Class A22s, but they did not live up to expectations and, in 1949, were transferred to less arduous duties south of the border. Being the least economical of all of the ex LNER Pacifics, they were some of the first to be withdrawn and all were scrapped by the early 1960s. All being well, at least one of the new build Class P2 were returned to the main line. A seventh member of the class, number 2007, Prince of Wales, is being constructed by the P2 Steam Locomotive Company, and the Doncaster P2 Locomotive Trust plans to build a replica of number 2001, Cocker the North. Jubilee Class As part of the London Midland and Scottish Railway standardisation policy, William Stania introduced a mainline passenger locomotive intended for wide route availability, particularly on lines that were unsuitable for the heavier Royal Scot class. They were a tapered boiler development of the Patriot class and had similar lines to his mixed traffic Black Fives but boasted larger driving wheels, three cylinders and a superior power output. When they first entered service in 1934, their performance was disappointing due to poor steaming, but this was overcome by modifications to the blast pipe, chimney and firebox. The class were not blamed initially, but in 1935 a newly built locomotive, number 5642, exchanged identities with the first member of the class, number 5552, and was specially turned out in black livery with chrome embellishments. It was named Silver Jubilee to commemorate the Silver Jubilee of King George V, and from then on they became known as the Jubilee class. Initially, the locomotives were delivered with the Fowler 3,500 gallon tenders, but most were replaced with Stania's standard 4,000 gallon tender. The Jubilees were hard-working engines, capable of fast running, and were used all over the LMS network. They were a common sight on the main line from St Pancreas to the Midlands, the West Coast Main Line, and cross-country routes between Bristol, Birmingham, Leeds, and York. In 1942, two Jubilees, numbers 5735 Comet and 5736 Phoenix, were rebuilt with larger, higher-pressure boilers and double chimneys. These served as test beds for the rebuilding of the Royal Scot and Patriot classes 
and although highly successful, no further jubilees were rebuilt. A few of the class received double chimneys, and British Railways fitted four locomotives with them in 1961. The majority of the class survived until the early to mid-1960s, an exception being number 45637 Windward Islands, which was damaged beyond economic repair in the tragic accident involving three passenger trains at Harrow and Weldstone on 8th of October 1952. Gresley Class A4 Nigel Gresley's magnificent Class A3s paved the way for an even better design to meet the LNER's requirement for a locomotive to haul its prestigious Silver Jubilee trains. There was still an intense rivalry between the LNER and LMS to gain the fastest service between London and Scotland, so high speed was a vital element of the design. There was also increasing interest in diesel power following its introduction on express passenger services in Germany and Gresley was determined to show that steam was still the order of the day. In 1935, the first Class A4, number 2509 Silverlink, emerged from Doncaster Works in a striking three-toned grey livery. Essentially, it was a refined A3 with a wedge-shaped streamlined casing, which had been inspired by a Bugatti railcar that Gresley had observed in France. Unlike other British streamlined locomotives, the A4s were successful in lifting the exhaust clear of the driver's cab and were one of the few classes of streamlined steam locomotives in the world to retain this feature throughout their existence. During a trial run with the Silver Jubilee train, Silver Link achieved a maximum speed of 112.5 miles an hour and an average speed of over 100 miles per hour on a 43 mile stretch. Both were world records at the time. Following the success of Silver Jubilee, more streamlined services were introduced in 1937. The Coronation, which ran between London and Edinburgh, and the West Riding, which ran between London, Leeds and Bradford. Another 31 A4s were built, and those allocated to the Coronation services were adorned in garter blue livery that later became standard for the whole class. On the 3rd of July 1938, number 4468 Mallard, which was the first of the class to be built with a Kilchap double chimney, set a world record of 126 miles per hour whilst hauling six coaches and a dynamometer car to record an accurate speed between Grantham and Peterborough. That record has never been broken by a steam locomotive. The onset of World War II saw the end of glamorous trains and record-breaking attempts. The A4s lost some of their streamlining to ease maintenance. They also lost their distinctive chime whistles because it was thought that these might be confused with air raid sirens, but these were replaced after the war. One locomotive, number 4469, Sir Ralph Wedgwood, was lost on the 29th of April 1942 due to bomb damage, although its tender survived. In 1948, attempts were made to restart non-stop services between London and Edinburgh. But due to serious flooding and the collapse of a number of bridges on the northern sector of the East Coast Main Line during August, trains had to be diverted over the Settle to Carlisle Line and Waverley Route. It was during this period that A4 number 60028 Walter K. Wiggum ran from Edinburgh to King's Cross, setting a British non-stop distance record for steam of 408.65 miles. Pre-war speeds were never regained, although on the 23rd of May 1959, number 60007 Sir Nigel Gresley set a post-war British steam speed record of 112 miles per hour. Instances of high-speed running in excess of 100 miles per hour were common for the A4s, and no other class of steam locomotive could match them. They became affectionately known by enthusiasts and loco spotters as streaks. The class continued to give superb performances in the British Railways era, and remained on the top link duties until being replaced by the Deltics in the 1960s. The first engines to be withdrawn and scrapped were from the King's Cross Shed in 1962, and the last passenger service to be hauled by an A4, number 60024 Kingfisher, was on the 14th of September 1966 between Aberdeen and Glasgow.
Such was their popularity that more A4s have been preserved than any other class of LNER locomotive. Three have seen regular use on the main line, two were presented to museums in North America, and Mallard remains a national treasure. In 2013, all six surviving A4s were brought together for the great gathering at the National Railway Museum York to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Mallard's unbeaten record-breaking run. Gresley Class V2 Competition from road haulage during the 1930s spurred on the London and North Eastern Railway's ambition to introduce fast, overnight express freight services. Introduced by Nigel Gresley in 1936, the Class V2s were highly successful mixed traffic locomotives intended for this purpose. They incorporated a number of standard features and much of their heritage was attributed to the designs of classes P2, A1 and A3. However, Gresley broke new ground with a 262 wheel arrangement, which allowed the rear pony truck, known as a car tazzy, to support a wide firebox similar to that carried by the A3. The driving wheels were identical in size to those of the P2, and the three cylinders were capable of turning them at high speeds whilst providing excellent adhesion. The V2s were the only 262 tender locomotive mass-produced in Britain, although there were many tank locomotive designs. The first member of the class was named Green Arrow to give publicity to a new Anglo-Scottish bulk freight and parcel service of the same name. It was soon found that the V2s performed equally well on express passenger and freight duties. During World War II, they achieved some astonishing feats of haulage and gained the reputation of being the engine that won the war. In March 1940, one V2 is recorded as hauling a train of 26 coaches packed with troops from Peterborough to King's Cross. They could compete with the A3 Pacifics and often deputise for them. Their only shortcomings were the restrictions imposed on route availability due to a heavy axle loading. Although the V2s were generally reliable, a few modifications were necessary during their careers. The pony truck for the leading axle was redesigned following a series of derailments and, for 71 locomotives, the monoblock cylinder casting was replaced with individual cylinder castings to overcome fractured components. A few V2s were fitted with kill chap exhausts and double chimneys, which gave them a comparable performance to the A3 Pacifics, but this enhancement arrived too late for the whole fleet to be modified. Princess Coronation Class the introduction of Nigel Gresley's class A4s and streamlined trains on the East Coast Main Line intensified the rivalry between the LNER and the LMS in the mid-1930s. When the LMS began to slip behind due to a lack of suitably powerful express locomotives, William Stanier took steps to improve upon his Princess Royal class. The new locomotives were specifically intended to haul the prestigious Coronation Scott Express services between London and Glasgow, in direct competition with the LNER's Coronation Expresses that ran between London and Edinburgh. Both of these trains were named to commemorate the coronation of King George VI in 1937. The problem for Stania was that the West Coast Main Line had challenging gradients, particularly over the summits at Shap and Betock, so a larger boiler and firebox were essential. The first locomotive, suitably adorned in a streamlined casting and a striking blue livery with silver lining to match the Coronation Scott special coaches, emerged from Crew Works in 1937, looking magnificent. Its name was Coronation, and in light of their heritage, the production of further locomotives led to them being known as the Princess Coronation class although footplate crews nicknamed them the Big Lizzies. The second batch of locomotives were painted in Crimson Lake, with lining in gold, vermilion and black to match the livery of the standard LMS coaches. Not all of the class were built as streamliners. 14 of the 38 were built as conventional locomotives. Although the design was credited to Stania, much of it, and particularly the streamlining, was attributable to Derby's chief draftsman, Tom Coleman. An unusual feature of the Coronation class was that their tenders were fitted with a steam-operated coal pusher to bring coal forward from the back of the tender. In 
This equipment greatly helped the firemen to meet the high demands of the fire. During trials with a special train in 1937, Coronation achieved a speed of 114 miles per hour, which broke the British speed record of 112.5 miles an hour set by the LNER's Silver Link in September 1935. However, glory was short-lived for the LMS because the record was smashed by the LNER's Mallard in July 1938. A further trial in February 1939 with number 6234, Duchess of Abercorn, which was unstreamlined and had been fitted with a double chimney, demonstrated the full capacity of the class. Hauling a train of 20 coaches and over 600 tonnes between Crewe and Glasgow, it sustained in excess of 3,300 horsepower for five minutes and became the most powerful steam locomotive to ever run on British rails. However, to achieve this feat, it required two firemen to shovel coal into the fire at a fast enough rate. In January 1939, number 6229, Duchess of Hamilton, swapped identities with number 6220, Coronation, for a tour of the USA, which included being put on public display at the World Trade Fair in New York. During this visit, it carried a large headlight and bell at the front of the locomotive. Due to the outbreak of World War II, the locomotive became stranded in the country and did not return to England until 1942, whereupon it resumed its true identity. The Princess Coronations were an excellent design from the outset, and a few modifications were necessary. Although double chimneys were fitted from 1939, and smoke deflectors became standard from 1945, the locomotives fitted with streamlining had it removed from 1946 onwards, as it offered little towards improving overall performance, and caused difficulties with access for maintenance. The last two members of the class were built with modifications made by Stania's successor, H.G. Ivert. These included a new type of superheater, Timken roller bearings, and a self-cleaning smoke box, and a substantially redesigned lower rear end and trailing truck. The Princess Coronations, widely regarded as Stania's ultimate masterpiece, were the most powerful passenger steam locomotives ever to be built for the LMS network. Ironically, when withdrawn in the early 1960s, they were more powerful than the diesels that replaced them. Merchant Navy Class During the 1930s, the Southern Railway had fallen behind the other major railway companies in modernising its fleet of ageing locomotives. However, in 1937, Oliver Bullied was appointed as its chief mechanical engineer, and he had spent many years as the personal assistant to Nigel Gresley. He also had extensive knowledge of locomotive developments on the continent, so it was not surprising that his first major design was technologically advanced. It had a high-pressure boiler and welded steel firebox with thermic siphons to increase thermal efficiency. Bullied enveloped the locomotive in air-smooth casing, which blended with its own design of coaching stock, and gave it box pock wheels, which were lighter, yet stronger, than those with spokes. He also included a number of features to assist the locomotive crew. Chain-driven valve gear immersed in a sealed oil bath to reduce the burden of frequent oiling, a steam-operated fire door, an enclosed cab with excellent ergonomics and electric lighting. Introduced in 1941, under strict wartime conditions, the class was intended for fast passenger services in southern England and were named after shipping companies that used the Southern Railway's docks. The colloquial name Spamcan became popular with railwaymen and locospotters due to their resemblance with the distinctive tin cans in which Spam pre-cooked meat was sold. But Merchant Navy class was their official designation. Several versions of the tender were built with water capacities varying between 5,000 and 6,000 gallons, and these were swapped frequently between engines. Unfortunately, Bullied's novel features caused problems and maintenance difficulties, so starting in 1956, British Railways rebuilt the entire class to a more conventional design. Although retaining the frames, wheels and boiler, most of the radical features were dispensed with, the locomotives were highly attractive in their new guise and were widely regarded in terms of performance and smooth running as one of Britain's finest Pacifics. Thompson Class B1 
Sir Nigel Gresley died after a short illness in April 1941 and was succeeded as the LNER's chief mechanical engineer by Edward Thompson. Thompson had a totally different outlook on locomotive design and was a great believer in simplicity and standardization. Where possible, he used existing LNER components, including boilers, wheels and tenders, to make savings in the austere wartime conditions. At the top of his priorities, he saw the need for a powerful mixed traffic locomotive to replace numerous obsolescent classes from the pre-grouping era. Thompson came up with an unsophisticated general purpose design that was the first two-cylinder mainline LNER locomotive to be built since 1923. Gresley had always favoured three cylinders. It was a purposeful, well-proportioned locomotive that became designated the Class B1 and was the LNER's equivalent of the GWR Hall and LMS Black 5. Production of the first 10 locomotives began in 1942, but deliveries were slowed due to the war. Following the end of hostilities, construction was spread across various locations and a further 400 were built up until 1952. The first locomotive was named Springbok in connection with the visit of the South African Prime Minister and in light of their sprightly performance. It seemed appropriate to name the subsequent 40 locomotives after species of antelope. Unofficially, the class were nicknamed Bongos after the name of number 1005. The B1s could be found all over the LNER network, including the former Great Eastern, Great Northern and Great Central lines, where they put in superb performances on top link expresses. They were also highly successful in Scotland, due to their ability to pull away with heavy trains on steep gradients. Undoubtedly the best of Thompson's designs, the B1s shared mixed opinions with footblade crews. They were good steamers with fast acceleration but were criticised for rough riding. Withdrawal came long before the end of their projected working lives, with some engines seeing little more than 10 years service. The last three were withdrawn in 1967. WD Austerity Class 8F During World War II, a large number of freight locomotives were built for the War Department, WD. Initially, the Stanier Class 8F was the prime choice for this purpose, but a simpler and more economic design was sought. The intention was to have a basic design that could be built by several different builders using standard parts. Robert Arthur Riddles, a locomotive engineer who had worked under Sir William Stanier, was Director of Transportation Equipment at the Ministry of Supply. And he introduced a radical new concept of locomotive design based on simplicity. All refinements were eliminated to ensure reliability under military operating conditions on a war-torn and poorly maintained infrastructure. The result was a locomotive with a parallel boiler and a box tender that looked austere compared to the elegant designs that had emerged before. Hence, they became known as the Austerities. Production of the Austerities was rapid thanks to their simplicity and thousands of hours were saved in construction. At one point, seven locomotives per week were being delivered. Two similar types were built between 1943 and 1945. They were identifiable by their boiler lengths and wheel arrangements, a 280 version, 935 built, and a 210 version, 150 built. The latter had a lighter axle loading to make it more suitable for secondary lines. Many of the locomotives saw service in mainland Europe and in the Middle East. At the end of hostilities, most were repatriated, but some were sold to foreign customers. Upon the nationalisation of the railways in 1948, British Railways took ownership of 733 of the 280s and 25 of the 210s, and two of each version were purchased by the Longmoor Military Railway in Hampshire. The austerities were rugged and reliable locomotives that lasted much longer than envisaged, with the last BR280 and 210 examples being withdrawn in 1962 and 1967 respectively. The Greek 210s remained in service until the late 1970s, and two of these were rescued for preservation in Great Britain. West Country and Battle of Britain classes. <laughs> 
Although highly successful in meeting the Southern Railway's need for a powerful express locomotive, Bully's merchant navy class were too heavy for most of the Southern's key routes. So he developed a class that was scaled down and lighter. The first of this new design appeared in 1945, and it was decided to name the class after West Country towns and cities. A later batch of engines was named after famous personalities, aircraft, fighter squadrons, and airfields that had been involved in the Battle of Britain. Although split into two different classes by their names, West Country and Battle of Britain, the locomotives were identical, and collectively they were referred to as bullied light Pacifics. They were delivered with Bullied's unusual numbering system that he adopted from continental practice. Performance, in terms of haulage capacity and sustained speed, was excellent, and these fine engines worked both passenger and freight services between London, the South Coast, and the South West, including the challenging Somerset and Dorset line. After the nationalisation of the railways in 1948, a series of exchange trials were conducted, which allowed certain classes from the Big Four to venture into new territory. During this period, a few West Country and Battle of Britain class locomotives found themselves a long way from home, the most notable being number 34004 Yeovil, which ran on the Scottish Highland Line between Perth and Inverness. Two significant modifications were made to the engines shortly after their introduction. The smoke deflectors were lengthened, and the cab was cut back and given larger front windows to give the crew better forward vision. Most of the novel features that Bullied had introduced in the Merchant Navy class were incorporated into his lighter design, which inevitably led to similar maintenance issues. To address the situation, a rebuilding programme began in 1957, but for economic reasons only 60 engines were rebuilt. Modernisation brought the careers of the Bullied Light Pacifics to an early demise, and they were all withdrawn between 1963 and 1967. Peppercorn Class A2 The post-war years were a turbulent time for the Big Four railway companies, as they were recovering from a long period of hardship and austerity. This was particularly so for the London and North Eastern Railway, which underwent a major change in direction with locomotive designs by Edward Thompson. He set in train a number of passenger and mixed traffic designs that were simple and easy to maintain. These included the rebuilding of Gresley's P2 class, which had become known as the class A2-2, and the last four Gresley class V2s, which were built as Pacifics and designated class A2-1. In 1944, Thompson authorised the building of 30 Pacifics, based on the class A2-2 and these were classified as A2-3. However, Thompson was succeeded by Arthur Peppercorn in 1946, and he had made improvements to this cumbersome design. The last 15 were built to his specification and became known as the Peppercorn Class A2. The first A2, number 525, A. H. Peppercorn, was the last LNER Pacific to be built before the nationalisation of the railways in 1948, and appropriately, it was named after its designer. These locomotives incorporated a number of modern features, including a speedometer, electric lighting, a self-cleaning smoke box and ash pan, but somewhat surprisingly, only a single chimney. That said, the last one off the production line was fitted with the Kilchap double blast pipe, and five other engines received these retrospectively. In terms of maintenance and efficiency, the A2s were highly cost effective and frequently ran over 100,000 miles between major servicing. They were ideal for operating in the northern sector of the former LNER and were best known for their work in Scotland, where they had replaced Gresley's troublesome P2s. However, they did not share the same prestige as the Gresley Pacifics because they were designed for heavy loads rather than light, fast trains. The last three examples in service, all allocated to Dundee Shed, were withdrawn in 1966 and one, number 60523 Blue Peter, was secured for preservation after a successful appeal by the TV programme of the same name. Peppercorn Class A1 Unlike his predecessor, 
Arthur Peppercorn favoured Nigel Gresley's philosophies when it came to locomotive designs. Having refined Thompson's Class A2 design, he used this as a basis for a Pacific using the same boiler and cab, but with larger driving wheels and a Kilchap double blast pipe. Class A4 streamlining was intended, but the British Railways executive overruled this in order to save costs. These locomotives became known as Class A1, and although a pure LNER design, they were all built after nationalisation. The first of 49 engines was delivered in August 1948, and all were named, albeit with a mixture of themes. They were the last in a long line of famous express passenger steam locomotives built for service on the East Coast Main Line. Unfortunately, Peppercorn's untimely death in March 1951 meant that he saw little of the energetic work that these excellent machines performed. Although more powerful than the A4 Pacifics and less prone to wheel slips, they did not have the corridor tenders, and this prevented them from taking charge of the London to Edinburgh non-stop services. The class required few modifications during their working lives. Five locomotives were equipped with Timken roller bearings, but although very successful in increasing time between major repairs, they were deemed too expensive to warrant fitting to the whole fleet. Some locomotives were fitted with silencers in their smoke boxes to counter the sound of the ejectors while standing in stations. Frugal and free steaming, the Peppercorn A1s were the most reliable and economic of all British Pacific designs, capable of hauling 15 coach trains at a sustained speed of 70 miles per hour. They did sterling work in their short lives. The first was withdrawn in 1962, and the last, number 60145, St Mungo, which had a working life of only 17 years, was withdrawn in 1966. The entire class was scrapped, but in 2008, a brand new A1 was built to the original design, while incorporating modern mainline requirements. It was given the number of the 50th member of the class, 60163, and named Tornado. Britannia class. Following the Interregional Locomotive Exchange trials in 1948, British Railways revealed plans for 12 standard classes of locomotive. Robert Riddles was the man in charge of locomotive procurement for the newly nationalised railways, and he began with a design for a mixed traffic Pacific. With economy, efficiency and ease of maintenance still fresh in his mind from the war years, he introduced the first two-cylinder mainline Pacific in Great Britain. The lack of the third cylinder and motion between the frames meant the locomotive was lighter and easier to maintain. The design was strongly influenced by the strengths of earlier designs, most notably the Merchant Navy class and Princess Coronation class, and included many features considered to be best practice from the Big Four. The tender was a more sophisticated version of those fitted to the WD Austerity 280 and 210 classes. The last 10 engines to be built were coupled to BR tenders that were similar to an LMS design, with increased coal capacity and a mechanical coal pusher. The pioneer of the class emerged from crew works on the 2nd of January 1951 and was named Britannia. It was the first of many to receive symbolic British names that included William Shakespeare, Robert Burns and Charles Dickens. Early on, the class encountered some serious mechanical problems, but these were quickly rectified. Although not universally popular, the Britannias were excellent engines. Their introduction transformed services on the East Anglian Expresses, which, at one point, were the fastest services in the country. By the end of the 1950s, they were seeing widespread use on all of the Briar regions, and being more economical than the Merchant Navy class. Two were regularly employed on the southern region's prestigious Golden Arrow service. However, BR's modernisation plan put a stop to construction after 1954, which meant that the Britannias had a very short working life, and the bulk of the class was withdrawn between 1966 and 1967. The last operational member of the class, number 70013, Oliver Cromwell, was one of the last steam locomotives to haul a passenger train on British Railways on August the 11th, 1968.
Standard Class 5. The 12 standard classes that were introduced by Robert Riddles bore a strong family resemblance to each other, with their tapered boilers, two cylinders, high running plates, streamlined cabs and standard fittings. Labour-saving devices were also a common feature, some of which had been gained from experience with the American S160 locomotives that had operated in Britain during World War II. Of note, self-cleaning smoke boxes became standard, which meant that smoke box stores only had to be open for boiler examinations and washouts. The most powerful standard engines, the Pacifics, were all given wide fireboxes to provide good steaming, but the mixed traffic and freight locomotives had narrow fireboxes to avoid the need for a trailing truck. Visually, the LMS influence was obvious in the standard class 5, which was heavily based on the Stania Black 5. However, the improvements that Riddles introduced made them much more capable machines. There were some notable differences among the class. Firstly, six different types of tender were fitted depending on operating requirements. For example, locomotives allocated to the southern region were attached to tenders with greater water capacity to overcome the lack of water troughs. Secondly, 30 locomotives were built with Caparotti valve gear and poppet valves. Developed from an Italian design, the operation of this system depended on camshafts rather than piston valves and, although more complex and difficult to maintain, gave a distinct power advantage over the conventional engines. Only 20 locomotives were named in service, all belonged to the southern region, and they took their names from withdrawn King Arthur class engines. The standard class 5s were allocated to all regions of the British railway network, and were universally popular with crews due to their excellent performance and reliability. They could be found on diverse duties from short pickup freights to mainline expresses, and often substituted for Pacifics. The class worked on many of BR's last steam hauled passenger services. Standard Class 4 Tank The Standard Class 4 Tank was the most numerous of the standard tank locomotives built by British Railways. It was based on the well-proven and highly versatile Stania and Fairburn designs that had been constructed in large numbers for the LMS between 1935 and 1951. With their free steaming, excellent acceleration and smooth riding characteristics, they were ideally suited for commuter and suburban traffic. Initially allocated to all regions of British Railways except the Western, with the Southern and Scottish gaining large numbers to replace their older types, they were much admired by both footplate crews and maintenance staff. The majority of the class were built at the former LBSCR works at Brighton, and two smaller batches were built at Derby and Doncaster works. The full order was not completed. Fifteen were cancelled due to the modernisation programme that curtailed the manufacturing of steam locomotives. When designed, it was expected that these large tank engines would be required to spend considerable time operating bunker first, to save time turning them between tightly scheduled commuter services. To that end, the coal bunker was designed with an inset to give the crew good forward visibility from the cab when running in reverse. Apart from minor differences to the coupling rods and their fittings, no other modifications were made to the class. The standard class Ford tanks were one of the most successful of the BR standard designs and did sterling work on the suburban services between London, Tilbury and South End. They were also intensively used on the commuted lines around Glasgow and on local services in Kent and East Sussex. However, they were struck down in their youth and all were retired by mid-1967. With much useful life remaining, many of these versatile tank locomotives were fortunate to escape the cutter's torch and have found new homes on heritage railways. At the time of writing, all but three of the 15 preserved locomotives have been operational with four having seen service on the main line. Class 08 From the mid-1930s, the LMS had been attracted by the economy and instant availability of diesel traction. They acquired a number of prototype diesel locomotives, and among the most successful was a shunter designed by the English Electric Company, which had six coupled wheels, 
driven by a 350 horsepower engine and electric transmission. Although there were small production runs of these machines, both before and during World War II, it was not until after the war that serious production began. After nationalisation in 1948, British Railways carried out an evaluation of the type and decided that the design, with some minor modifications, was ideal to meet its shunter requirements. This was the genesis of what would later be known as the Class 08 diesel shunter. And with 996 being built between 1952 and 1962, it was the most numerous of all British locomotive classes. Over the years, many minor modifications were made to the class to enhance their utility and to prolong their lives. Some were fitted with radios to enable communications between their driver and controllers in large marshalling yards. Other modifications included the fitting of waterproof cab doors to enable their use through carriage washing plants, different headlights for specific routes, and roof-mounted flashing warning beacons. A modification reflecting advances in technology in the 21st century was the installation of remote control equipment, allowing locomotives to be driven by a member of staff remote from the locomotive. The most extraordinary modification of all involved the permanent coupling of two Class 08s, with the cab of the leading locomotive being removed to form a permanently coupled master and slave unit. Known as Class 13, three of these combinations were used for hump shunting duties at Tinsley Marshalling Yards between 1965 and 1985. As its standard, general purpose diesel shunter, BR deployed the Class 08 to every region of its network. The class became a familiar sight at many freight and marshalling yards, major stations and traction maintenance depots. However, over the course of time, the nature of rail traffic changed with the introduction of fixed rates of container wagons and passenger carrying multiple units, which reduced the demand for shunting locomotives. Consequently, large numbers of the class were withdrawn from use and stored, scrapped, exported or sold to industrial and heritage railways. The remaining members of the class became employed as convenient utility engines on more mundane duties than for those they were intended. That said, it is expected that examples of this venerable warhorse will remain operational for many years to come, as no replacement is in sight. In addition to the large number of Class 08s built, there were also 26 Class 09 and 146 Class 10 locomotives, which were outwardly very similar but mechanically different. The Class 09 locomotives had different gearing to provide a higher top speed at the expense of tractive effort, and the Class 10 locomotives were powered by Blackstone diesel engines and GEC traction motors. A number of locomotives, based on the Class 08 design, were also built for export. Standard Class 9F the last in Robert Riddle's series of standard class locomotives was a heavy freight design capable of hauling trains up to 900 tonnes. Known as the standard class 9F, it was one of the most powerful and arguably the most successful of all the steam locomotive types to be built in Great Britain. Key features of the design were a 2 10 wheel arrangement to give increased traction and low axle loading flangeless centre driving wheels to allow the locomotive to traverse tight radius curves and a highly efficient boiler. Despite the imminent withdrawal en masse of steam locomotives on British railways, a number of technical experiments were carried out on 9Fs in the pursuit of further improving their power and efficiency. Three engines were built with mechanical stokers, and one was fitted with a Giesel injector, an Austrian-designed multiple blast pipe that replaced the standard version and chimney. Ten locomotives were fitted with the distinctive but ungainly Franco Crosti boiler, another continental feature, which had a second drum under the main boiler to preheat the water. The hot gases passed through both and were ejected through an additional chimney mounted on the right hand side of the boiler. None of the experiments were deemed worthy of further investment. However, double chimneys were fitted to the locomotives in the later years, and some were retrofitted to engines built earlier. Various types of the larger BR tenders were attached, depending on requirements. The standard 9Fs were not only highly capable heavy freight machines, they also put in spirited performances in charge of express services, with some being clocked at 90 miles per hour. In this regard, they were often used on relief trains and as standby locomotives.
The last of the class was built at Swindon in March 1960, carrying the number 92220 and named Evening Star. It was specially turned out in BR Line green livery with the copper cap chimney. It was also the last steam locomotive to be built for British Railways and had a working life of only five years before being secured as the part of the national collection. Deltic. The English Electric Company, who had gained experience in building diesel locomotives for the export market since the 1930s, built a prototype locomotive, which it loaned to British Railways in 1955 for evaluation. It was powered by two Napier Deltic engines, similar to those that had been used in naval gunboats. These were two-stroke, 18-cylinder engines with an output of 1,650 horsepower each. The power unit was a complex and compact yet light design with three banks of cylinders in a V formation, hence the name Deltic, which originates from Delta, the Greek for triangle. The locomotive was painted in a striking powder blue livery with aluminium trim and pale yellow embellishments. It had no number, although it was officially known as DP1, and simply carried the name Deltic. Initial trials took place on the London Midland Region main line between Liverpool and London, where Deltic gave some excellent performances. Subsequently, it ran between Carlisle and Skipton, where it continued to impress, but it was deemed too expensive to meet the London Midland Region's future requirements. However, the management of the Eastern Region could see the potential of the machine as a replacement for their top link Pacifics on the East Coast main line so an order was placed in 1958 for 23, later reduced to 22, production locomotives. A few design changes were necessary, including a reduction in the loading gauge and the fitting of improved generators and traction motors. Deltic was transferred to Hornsey Depot in 1959, so that experience with the locomotive could be gained on services from King's Cross. Unfortunately, it suffered serious engine failure in March 1961, and was withdrawn from service. But by then, delivery of the production machines had begun. The locomotive was never taken into British Railways ownership, and after withdrawal, it was donated by the English Electric Company to the Science Museum in London. In 1993, it was moved to the National Railway Museum at York, and has been on display more recently at Shildon and the Ribble Steam Railway. Class 20. The modernisation plan for British Railways was published in December of 1954. Among its recommendations was the large-scale replacement of steam locomotives with diesel and electric traction. However, implementation of the plan was poorly managed, and large number of diesels were rushed into service without thorough testing. This resulted in shortfalls in performance and poor reliability, which led to a number of classes being withdrawn soon after their steam counterparts. One of the most successful of the Pioneer diesel classes was a design intended for light freight duties. The initial order was for 20 locomotives, but due to the failings of other Pioneer Type 1 diesels, subsequent orders took the total to 228. The design was unusual in having a single cab at one end, and this gave rise to the frequent sight of locomotives being coupled nose to nose when used in tandem operation. Power was provided by the relatively simple but reliable 1,000 horsepower English Electric 8SVT unit and four traction motors. Among enthusiasts, the Class 20s gained the nickname Choppers due to the beat of their engines resembling the sound of helicopters. The main visual difference between the earlier and the later members of the class was the train indicator systems. Initially white discs were used, as in the steam era but these were superseded by electric route indicator boxes. A few Class 20s that operated over the single lines in Scotland had a tablet catcher recess on the side of the cab. The Class 20s were predominantly allocated to the London Midland, Eastern and Scottish regions. Although used mainly on freight trains, they hauled passenger services occasionally. A considerable number of the class were refurbished in the early 1980s, which extended their lives into the 21st century. A few were involved with the construction of the Channel Tunnel, and some ventured onto the continent. Other unusual duties have included weed killing and nuclear flask trains. Class 40 
Under the pilot scheme of the modernization plan for British Railways, 10 express diesel locomotives were ordered. Many aspects of the design were based on prototype locomotives that had seen service on the London, Midland and Southern regions between 1947 and 1954. These imposing machines were powered by a 2,000 horsepower English electric 16 SVT engine and six traction motors with a one Coco One wheel arrangement. Train heating was provided by a steam boiler. Originally known as the English Electric Type 4 and numbered D200 to D209, they were put to work and evaluated on the former Great Eastern Line between London and Norwich, and on the East Coast Main Line. Initial reports among railwaymen and senior officials were unfavourable, who claimed that their performance was little better than that of a Britannia steam-class locomotive. However, the London Midland region saw their potential as a replacement for their ageing express steam locomotives on routes that required good acceleration and sustained high speed, and this helped to secure a number of repeat orders. As with the Class 20s, developments in train indicator systems at the time of production resulted in white discs being fitted to the earlier locomotives, and electric route indicator boxes, of which there were several versions to the later batches. From 1973, the class of 199, one had been lost due to accident damage, became class 40 under the TOPS classification system. Among enthusiasts, the class 40s gained the nickname Whistlers due to the distinctive sound of their turbochargers. A class 40, number D326, was in charge of the mail train that was involved in the Great Train Robbery at Leadburn in Buckinghamshire on the 8th of August 1963. The introduction of more powerful diesel and electric traction in the 1970s meant that Class 40s were soon relegated to secondary work, including heavy freight, which kept many active until the mid-1980s. The pioneer of the class, number D200, was saved from scrapping by enthusiasts who managed to get the locomotive reinstated for use as a celebrity engine, and later secured as part of the national collection. Class 81 the first type of AC electric locomotive to enter service with British Railways was known as Class AL1 and under TOPS became Class 81. It formed one of five pioneer classes, AL1 to AL5, totalling 100 locomotives, which were built by different manufacturers to evaluate designs for the development of future electric locomotives for use on the West Coast Main Line. Painted in a distinctive electric blue livery and capable of speeds up to 100 miles per hour, there were mixed traffic machines based on a BR specification that was influenced by an experience in France. These classes all had the same body shell, cab layouts and pantographs. The latter collected 25 kV AC from overhead wires and rectifiers were used to convert this into DC for powering the traction motors. Initially equipped with two pantographs, only one was used in service and the other was removed to reduce maintenance. Due to the small clearances for the overhead wires under bridges and tunnels, the locomotives had to be capable of switching automatically to a lower voltage, but in practice this was not required due to improvements in the overhead infrastructure. The AL1s entered traffic on the first section of the WCML to be electrified between Manchester and Crewe. In September 1960, as electrification became more widespread, they could be seen on all of the major West Coast mainline routes. On the 6th of January 1968, Class AL1 locomotive, number E3009, was hauling a passenger train, which was in a fatal collision with a low loader carrying a 120-ton transformer over a level crossing at Hickson in Staffordshire. The locomotive was destroyed and subsequently scrapped. All of the early AC electric classes were prone to failures and fires and were soon relegated to secondary duties such as parcels, freight and empty stock. Although the first to be introduced and among the last to be withdrawn, the AL1s were not the most successful of the pioneer electric locomotive classes. This honour went to the class AL5 or class 85, which underpinned the design for BR's first standard AC electric locomotive, the class AL6 or the class 86. Class 37. Under the modernization plan for British Railways, 
the requirement for a versatile mixed-traffic diesel locomotive was identified, and the English Electric Co. came forward with a design based on one that had been used for export to meet this requirement. It was known initially as the English Electric Type 3, and later as the Class 37. Powered by a 1,750 horsepower English Electric 12 CSVT engine and six traction motors, it bore a strong family resemblance to the English Electric Type 4, or Class 40, but was more compact and had a cocoa wheel arrangement. Some were built with boilers for steam heating while on passenger duties. Introduced in 1960, the class was an immediate success due to its excellent performance and reliability. The first example saw service on the eastern region, with many operating passenger services in East Anglia, while others were employed on freight duties in the northeast. From 1963 onwards, a considerable number were delivered to the western region for freight duties to and from the Welsh valleys. Eventually, Class 37s could be found the length and breadth of Great Britain and were ideally suited to highland routes in Scotland. Among enthusiasts, the class gained the nicknames Tractors and Growlers due to the agricultural sound of their exhaust. During the mid-1980s, financial restraints meant that funding could not be provided to replace the diesel classes that had been in service since the late 1950s to the early 1960s. A major refurbishing programme was therefore embarked upon, which included a number of Class 37s. Specific modifications included replacement bogies and alternators, slow speed control and electric train heating, or ETH. Six locomotives were rebuilt to evaluate Merleys and Ruston engines, due to the marked differences that resulted between individual locomotives and their equipment, several subclasses were formed. With a relatively low axle loading, offering wide route availability, some of these veteran machines continue to provide a valuable service on both passenger and freight duties throughout the country. They have also been very popular with preservationists. Class 55 Deltic In the mid-1950s, British railways were facing stiff competition against the increasing use of motor vehicles and the expansion of the national motorway network. British Railways' modernisation plan was launched to counter this, and the replacement of steam with diesel traction gathered momentum. English Electric's prototype Deltic had proven capability, and the decision was taken to purchase a number of locomotives based on its design for use on the East Coast Main Line. The initial order was for 23 locomotives, but this was reduced to 22 before the contract was signed. They cost £155,000 each, and were built over a two-year period at the English Electric Works in Newton Lee Willows. When introduced in 1961, the Deltics were the most powerful diesel locomotives in the world and could exceed 100 miles per hour easily with a fully laden train. Such was their efficiency that the 22 Deltics replaced 55 Gresley Class A3 and A4 Pacifics. They cut the London to Edinburgh time from eight hours to six and this was improved further following upgrades to the route infrastructure. In the early 1970s, they became known as the Class 55, under British Rail's Total Operating Processing System, or TOPS. During their short but hard-working careers, the Deltics received modifications to make them compatible with the introduction of modern coaching stock. This included the replacement of vacuum brakes with air brakes, and the fitting of electric train heating equipment. Prolonged high-speed running took its toll and the class was plagued by engine failures, but a pool of spare engines allowed a means of quick replacement and return to service. The Deltics dominated the East Coast mainline services until the introduction of the HST125s in 1979. Some Deltics in need of heavy general overhauls were withdrawn as early as January 1980, while others soldiered on, carrying out less demanding duties until the class was officially retired at the end of 1981. Six have been preserved, and some have ventured back onto the main line to haul charters and specials. One, surprisingly, has been hired out for freight duties. Class 52, Western British Railways' modernisation plan of 1955 tended to favour the procurement of diesel locomotives with electric transmission. But the Western region opted for the hydraulic transmission, due to its proven success on the West German Railways. In theory, 
it offered reduced weight and thus a better power-to-weight ratio. Several designs were built, and some were more successful than others, such as the Class 42 warship. However, none was powerful enough to take over the mainline express duties from the King and Castle class steam locomotives, so a higher performance machine was required. Building on previous experience, the Class 52, as it would become known, was born in 1961. It was powered by two MD655 engines, built under license from Maybach, each rated at 1,350 brake horsepower, with Voith hydraulic transmission to a pair of three-axle bogies. With its stylish and elegant appearance, it looked very different from any other British diesel design, and to add to their appeal, the class carried the GWR-style cast number plates. All had names with Weston as a prefix, and hence they became known as the Westons. Although officially Class 52, under TOPS, they never carried TOPS numbers. Two locomotives were outshopped in eye-catching experimental colours, number D1000 in Desert Sand and number D1015 in Golden Ochre. The Class 52s were the most powerful diesel-hydraulic locomotive ever to be built in Great Britain. They were best known for their work on Premier Express services between London and the west of England, but were also highly capable of hauling heavy freight, including stone from the Foster Yeoman Quarry at Mayhead. Unfortunately, a number of factors came together that led to the Western's early demise. Their lack of electric train heating capability, an inability to operate in tandem, and ultimately, BR's decision to standardise with diesel-electric traction. First withdrawals began in 1973, and all were out of service by February 1977. Happily, the class enjoyed a strong following among enthusiasts, and seven were secured for preservation. Class 47 British Railways aimed to eliminate its entire fleet of steam locomotives by 1968, placed tremendous pressure on the re-equipment programme. By 1962, many steam locomotives have already been scrapped, while a number of the first-generation diesels were proving troublesome or failed to meet expectations. There was an urgent need for a large number of mixed traffic diesels with a power output of at least 2,500 horsepower and a low axle loading. To examine this requirement, three prototype locomotives were built by competing firms. However, due to time constraints, they were not fully evaluated and a contract was awarded to Brush Traction to build a new class of locomotive, incorporating an uprated version of the Saltzer power unit that had been fitted to one of the prototypes, number D0280 Lion. The result was the Brush Type 4, which under TOPS became Class 47. Before the first example was delivered in 1962, there was sufficient confidence in the design to order a further 30 locomotives. Over the next six years, several more batches were built, which brought the total to 512, making it the largest class of mainline diesel in BR history. Differences in train heating capability resulted in subclasses being formed, and those without train heating were intended mainly for freight duties. In the late 1960s, the engines were derated from 2,750 horsepower to 2,580 horsepower in order to reduce mechanical stress and improve reliability. One locomotive, number D1628, was badly damaged in an accident and was rebuilt as a testbed for Ruston engines. Over the years, a number of other modifications were incorporated, including push-pull equipment, slow-speed control and long-range fuel tanks the latter making them ideally suited for cross-country services. 33 locomotives were rebuilt with electromotive diesel engines and reclassified as the Class 57. The decline in locomotive hauled passenger services and the introduction of modern freight locomotives led to the gradual withdrawal of the class from the early 1990s onward. Now around 50 years old, a few remain in service on the main line, and several have been preserved for use on heritage railways. Class 50. One of the three prototypes that was built for evaluation by British Railways to meet the requirement for a diesel locomotive with a power output of at least 2,500 horsepower was known as DP2. Built by English Electric, its appearance resembled a production Deltic, or Class 55, but internally was a totally different machine. BR was attracted by the performance of its English Electric 16 CSVT 2700 horsepower engine, 
and place an order for 50, albeit incorporating a number of their own design requirements. Due to BR's financial problems at the time, the locomotives were leased initially for a 10-year period, with English Electric's own engineers providing maintenance at depots. They were known as the second-generation English Electric Type 4, and became the Class 50 under TOPS. All of the class entered service between 1967 and 1968 on the West Coast Main Line, primarily for top-link express services between Crewe and Glasgow. They often operated in tandem, producing superb performances on the steeply graded route. When electrification of the West Coast Main Line was completed in 1974, the entire class was transferred to the Western Region to replace the fleet of Class 52 diesel hydraulics that were being withdrawn. Unfortunately, due to their prolonged high-speed running, the locomotives became run down, and a decision was taken to conduct a major refurbishment programme. This work was undertaken by BR's Doncaster Works between 1979 and 1984. After returning to service, their reliability and availability improved considerably. A distinctive feature of the refurbished locomotives was the addition of a high-intensity headlight at each end. The class was nicknamed Hoovers by enthusiasts due to the distinctive sound made by their cooling fans. Although the Class 50s were displaced by high-speed trains or the Class 43, they soldiered on with less demanding duties. One locomotive was modified, unsuccessfully, to examine the class's potential as heavy freight engines. The majority of the class were retired in the early 1990s, but due to their popularity, three celebrities were retained for rail tours until 1944, and many have been preserved. Class 43 High Speed Train By the early 1970s, British Rail was facing stiff competition from the increasing popularity of the motor car. To overcome this, it needed to offer a reliable alternative that offered speed and comfort for business commuters and long-distance travellers. The long-term aim was for widespread electrification, but due to financial restraints, this would take time. It was therefore decided to develop a new concept in high-speed diesel trains, whereby a locomotive would be attached to each end of a fixed rake of modern air-conditioned coaches. A prototype was built and tested between 1973 and 1976, by which time BR was convinced of its potential. Production orders were placed and the locomotives, known as power cars, were built at Crewe while the coaching stock was built at Derby. The locomotives were powered by a lightweight 12-cylinder Paxman Valenta 2,250 horsepower engine and four brushed traction motors. A few were fitted with the GEC traction motors. With its aerodynamic nose and lack of buffers, the external appearance gave an impression of style and speed. They became known as Class 43 and the sets as High Speed Trains or HSTs. In service, they were branded as the Intercity 125, as they were capable of sustaining 125 miles per hour on certain sections of track. The presence of a locomotive at each end of the train allowed rapid turnarounds at Termini while offering continued operation en route should one unit develop a problem. First introduced on the western region, and later on the east coast main line, the HSTs revolutionised passenger services. On some timetables, HSTs were scheduled with a start-to-stop time requiring an average speed of over 100 miles per hour, the first time this had occurred in the history of British railways. Other principal routes that subsequently adopted HSTs included the Midland Main Line and cross-country services. In 1987, a HST set a new world record for diesel traction of 148.3 miles per hour. Since 2005, the Class 43s have been re-engined to improve efficiency and, often dubbed the best trains ever built in Britain, this will ensure that the HSTs will be around for some time to come. Class 90. In the late 1980s, British Rail introduced a fleet of mixed-traffic electric locomotives known as the Class 90. The design was based on experience from early electric types and incorporated many state-of-the-art features, including rheostatic brakes in addition to air brakes, microprocessors to detect motor slipping, thyristor control for smooth acceleration, and time division multiplexer TDM equipment, to allow multiple and push-pull working. The first machine was outshopped from Crew Works in 1987, 
wearing the intercity swallow livery that had been introduced to symbolise grace and speed. The Class 90s are powered by four GEC Alstom traction motors that produce 5,000 horsepower. Capable of 110 miles per hour running, they enter service on the West Coast Main Line and later on the East Coast Main Line, where they often deputised for Class 91s. In May 1988, a brand new member of the class, number 9008, was shipped to the continent and displayed at the Hamburg International Transport Traffic Exhibition, along with two other British electric locomotives. The Class 90s are perhaps the most colourful class of locomotives ever to operate on British railways, having worn no fewer than 27 different liveries in their 30-year history. From the outset, many Class 90s were dedicated freight locomotives and were identifiable by their attractive three-tone rail freight distribution livery. In 1991, five locomotives were repainted in Rail Express Systems livery and were employed on dedicated postal trains between London, the Midlands and the North. The following year, three locomotives were painted in the pseudo-European railways liveries, Belgian, German and French, and were all named Freight Connection in the appropriate European language. Upon the privatisation of British Rail in 1996, the Class 90 fleet was divided between several operators, including Virgin Trains, DB Schenker and Freightliner. In 2004, 15 Class 90s were transferred to the Great Eastern Main Line, where they are still active under the control of the current operator, Abellio Greater Anglia. Class 91 Electrification of the East Coast Main Line during the late 1980s offered significant improvements in the speed and frequency of trains on this historic route. More importantly, it reduced operating costs significantly when compared to diesel traction. To equip the new services, British Rail developed a train known as the Intercity 225, which was capable of 140 miles per hour or 225 kilometers an hour. The concept was to have an electric locomotive coupled to a rake of modern Mark IV coaches with an unpowered driving van trailer, or DVT, at the other end to provide a push-pull capability. GEC won the contract to design and build the locomotives. They produced an unusual design, which they called Project Electra. In that, the locomotive had a streamlined end and a blunt end. The streamlined end reduced drag during high-speed running, while the blunt end blended with the leading coach to reduce turbulence on the pantograph. The locomotives, known as the Class 91s, could be driven from either end, albeit rarely from the blunt end. The traction motors, which, usually, are mounted in the body, could develop 6,300 horsepower, making it the most powerful passenger locomotive ever built in Britain. Sadly, the true potential of the Intercity 225 was never realised, due to the speed restrictions imposed by incompatible signalling. However, a few short sections of the East Coast Main Line were upgraded for proving tests, which resulted in some record-breaking runs. On the 17th of September, 1989, a Class 91, number 91010, attained a speed of 161.7 miles per hour, which remains a record for a British locomotive. Another member of the class, number 91032, achieved the fastest time ever between King's Cross and Edinburgh, at just under three and a half hours and an average speed of 112.5 miles per hour. Prolonged high-speed running on an intensive timetable eventually took its toll on reliability, and the entire fleet of Class 91s had to be put through a refurbishment programme between 2000 and 2003. Along with upgraded coaches, this ensured that the Intercity 225 would remain the flagship of the East Coast Main Line until the introduction of the Hitachi Class 800 units. Class 66 when British Rail's freight operations were privatised in 1996, a new company was formed, called the English Wales and Scottish Railway, and it took control of approximately 93% of the UK's rail freight business, and a fleet of ageing diesel locomotives that were expensive to operate and maintain. At the time, the Foster Yeoman Company was operating privately owned American-built diesel locomotives for hauling aggregate from their quarries in Somerset over BR tracks. The performance of these locomotives 
known as Class 59, were superb and their reliability was exceptional. EWS was so impressed by them that it placed an order for 250 similar machines, known as Class 66, which were built at the Electromotive Diesel, or EMD, plant in Canada. Power was provided by a well-proven 12-cylinder EMD 710-3300 horsepower engine with six general motor traction motors, which differed from the Class 59, to enable higher speeds. Other key features included a 1,800 gallon fuel tank, which, being over twice the capacity of a Class 47, offered long range and increased availability, and radial steering bogies to reduce track wear. The introduction of Class 66 locomotives represented a radical shift in British locomotive policy towards procurement from overseas suppliers. These superb locomotives reinvigorated the rail freight business at a time when it needed to be more efficient and competitive. Such was their success that the subsequent orders were placed by Freightliner, GB Rail Freight and Direct Rail Services. The class have operated all over the British network and, in addition to freight, their duties have included engineering and works trains, nuclear flask trains and the occasional passenger charter. The class inherited the nickname Sheds by enthusiasts due to their front-end profile and angular roof. The introduction of stringent emission regulations has meant that it is unlikely that any more new Class 66 locomotives will be ordered. However, a considerable number of locomotives, known as the EMD Series 66, have been purchased by European railway companies, and a few of these have been imported for conversion to UK specifications. Class 68 Class 68 is a fleet of mixed-traffic diesel locomotives that are used to haul both passenger and freight trains. A significant advantage of their design is a combination of low axle loading, high power output and high speed. The locomotives are built by Voslo in Spain, and at the time of writing, 32 have been ordered. The locomotive is powered by a 16-cylinder, 3,800 horsepower engine supplied by Caterpillar Inc. The first locomotive, number 68001, spent several months during 2013 at the Velim Test Centre in the Czech Republic prior to delivery. The second locomotive, number 68002, was the first to arrive in the United Kingdom in January 2014. The fleet of Class 68 locomotives are owned by direct rail services, but six have been leased to Chiltern Railways for use on their mainline services. These are fitted with push-pull equipment to allow them to operate with Mark III coaches and a driving van trailer, or DVT which negates the need to uncouple the locomotive for return journeys. ScotRail also operate two leased Class 68s on services from Edinburgh on the Five Circle line. Looking to the future, it is planned that seven Class 68s will be leased from DRS for use on Trans Pennine Express services. As the most modern diesel locomotive currently operating on Britain's railways, the Class 68's versatility and efficiency is likely to ensure that they will provide a reliable service for many years to come. The Class 88 is a recent development of the Class 68. These locomotives feature the same body shell, cab, bogies, traction equipment and control software as the Class 68, but a dual mode capable of operating from either a 25 kW AC overhead line equipment or by an internal diesel engine. As such, the Class 88 will be the first dual-mode locomotive to use the overhead system on the British Railway network, as the only other electro-diesels draw current from the 750 volt DC third rail system used by the Southern Region. At the time of writing, DRS has ordered 10 Class 88s to serve as mixed traffic locomotives on routes that are not fully electrified. Now I hope you've all thoroughly enjoyed this audiobook adventure as I have in um, dictating it and reading it to you. And please support the official release of the book. The reason I chose this book is because it has fantastic illustrations and stats on the pages which I haven't been able to convey to you in this audiobook form and wasn't going to in um, video form either because I want everyone to pick up the original book. I don't do this prof for profit and I would really appreciate it if everyone enjoys this book uh, picking it up themselves. I'll leave a link in the YouTube description for the official release of the book on Amazon and if anyone's listening on SoundCloud or any other podcasting service please do look it up on Amazon or any good bookshop uh, that will have it 
on there because it's a fantastic book and I would love everyone to enjoy it as much as I have. Um, thank you so much for coming along with me on my first ever audiobook and I look forward to doing very many more audiobooks um, for fun. So until then, goodbye. <laughs>